Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on the development of an evidence-based guideline when evidence is scarce, the importance of a balanced guideline panel. My name is Bert Avo and I'm presenting this work on behalf of uh, my director, Professor Emmy de Buc. First off, I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. So we at the Belgian Red Cross are involved with the development of evidence-based first aid guidelines. And we have previously, for the first time in 2011, developed evidence-based first aid guidelines to teach basic first aid to lay people in Africa. So these guidelines are tailored to the African context, uh, which means that they, are that they specifically contain interventions that are available and feasible to the African layperson, and also uh, focus on topics with a high burden of disease in Sub-Saharan Africa. These guidelines have been updated for the first time in 2016. So on this map, you can see the countries where currently Basic First Aid for Africa is used by local Red Cross societies to train lame people in first aid. So these are mainly countries where the local Red Cross society closely collaborates with the Belgian Red Cross funders, with an emphasis on Southern and Eastern Africa. The project I would like to present to you today is called First Aid for First Responders. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is often a lack of emergency medical services. So this means that people who are in need often need to rely on fellow members of their community to help them. This means that there is a need for more advanced first aid techniques within these communities. And currently, local Red Cross societies already provide training to such people. And these people are called first responders, brigades d'urgence, rescuers, depending on the country they reside in. However, it uh, needs to em emphasize that these are still lay people. And currently, these training programs uh, did not have a manual that lives up to the standards of a basic first aid for Africa when it comes to methodology. So this is a gap that we aim to fill with this project. At the Belgian Red Cross, we develop our guidelines according to the principles of evidence-based practice. This means that we will base our recommendations on scientific evidence, which is being collected by the Center for Evidence-Based Practice. But we will also take into account preferences and resources of the target audience. And these are collected by our operational services the First Aid Service, the International Department. However, for this, uh, for this specific project, we have also taken into account uh, the knowledge and skills of content writers due to capacity issues at these operational services. In addition, we also take into account the experience of experts in the field. So for this project, we have composed an expert panel of 13 African experts in first aid and emergency medicine. On this slide, you can see an overview of our expert panel. We had six field experts aboard, which were people with extensive experience in first aid training that we've consulted from local Red Cross societies in Sub-Saharan Africa. In addition, we also had seven academic experts in emergency medicine on board, including one with methodological expertise. As you can see on the map below, the geographical spread of our expert panel was nice. In November 2018, we brought our expert panel for the first time together to discuss the content of the manual and also to compose research questions that need to be investigated. In total, these experts came up with 87 PICO questions that were investigated by the Center for Evidence-Based Practice. Our expert panel composed the table of content of our guideline. And this guideline is structured along the ABCDE approach for patient assessment. So the guideline first starts with a topic on describing the role of a first responder, so what a first responder can and cannot do. Next, the guideline has uh, two topics on approaching an injured person and gathering information. Then there is a topic on basic life support, followed by topics on area and breathing, circulation and damage and disability. Then the guideline discusses several forms of diseases and injuries that are common in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, road traffic injury, then there are two topics on incident management and support and disaster preparedness to finally conclude with a topic on preventing illness and injury. The evidence gathering process took place from December 2018 to February 2019. The Center for Evidence-Based Practice uh, developed an evidence summary for each of the 87 PICO questions that were proposed by the expert panel. Simultaneously, our content writers wrote a draft manual that was based on the evidence provided by CBAP. Where evidence was lacking or insufficient, the authors also used their own expertise to develop draft recommendations. So here you can see an overview of the evidence that we have collected. 
For a total of 87 PICO questions, we have screened through 36,000 references to eventually include 268 relevant publications. Of note, of these 268 publications, 13 were Cochrane reviews. So overall, 60% of the PICO questions were supported by any form of evidence of Orion quality. On the other hand, 40% of our PICO questions were not supported by any scientific evidence. So the first step in the development of this evidence-based guideline was the preparation of 87 evidence summaries by the Center for Evidence-Based Practice. Based on these evidence summaries and supplemented with own practical experience, our content writers wrote draft recommendations, which were then validated by our expert panel during a consensus meeting. In March 2019, we organized a two-day face-to-face expert panel meeting in Johannesburg, South Africa. Expert input proved crucial to the development of this guideline, as it was often found that the evidence was too limited or there was no evidence at all, or the evidence was too weak to base practical recommendation on, or the evidence required contextualization. So the task of the expert panel was twofold. They needed to contextualize identified evidence. Is it relevant and appropriate for the African context to make a certain recommendation? And they needed to formulate good practice points in case evidence was lacking. Good practice points are defined as important practical points on which the expert panel reaches consensus that nobody is likely to question. So here you can see a first example of contextualization by the expert panel. This is a case where there was limited evidence identified. So one of the PICO questions that our expert panel composed was on a met the optimal method of transport for people with a spinal injury in case an ambulance is lacking. So the PICO question was, in patients with possible spine injury, is a certain method to transport them in a car or on a motorcycle compared to another method more effective to change survival, functional recovery, pain, complications, and time to resolution of symptoms. We identified very low certainty evidence for harm for sitting or crouching during transport in case of suspected spinal injury. We found that lying down was associated with a significant decrease of mortality within six weeks or severe lasting dependence upon discharge when compared to crouching or sitting. The expert panel structured its recommendations according to the great evidence to decision framework. So they thought that the potential harms of sitting as identified by the evidence is likely to outweigh the potential benefits, which would be the possibility to wear a seatbelt. On the other hand, they thought that lying down would be both acceptable and feasible to stakeholders. Furthermore, they thought that there was no variation in how stakeholders would value the main outcomes. So this resulted in the practical recommendation that if there's a possibility that a person has a spinal injury, they must be transported in a lying down position. However, they also included the caveat that in optimal circumstances, this would be done by an appropriate equipped ambulance. However, they recognized that the mode of transport in practice would often be determined by resources, training, or other situation-dependent factors. A second example where the input of the expert proved crucial was the use of non-occlusive dressings for the management of an open chest wound. So the expert panel wondered whether non-occlusive dressings were appropriate for the management of an open chest wound by composing the following PICO question. In humans with an open chest wound, does using a non-occlusive dressing compared to no dressing change an outcome? So we at CBAP conducted a systematic search to answer this question, but we identified no evidence at all on the use of non-occlusive dressings for open chest injury. So the expert panel needs to formulate a GPP according to the great ETD framework. So the expert panel considered it uncertain whether the potential benefits of using such a dressing, which are bleeding control and avoiding infection, would outweigh the potential harms, being the development of an occlusive dressing and following this tension pneumothorax due to the soaking of the dressing. Secondly, they considered the research requirement of commercial non-occlusive dressings to be high for the African context, so the acceptability of this intervention would be variable. On the other hand, both commercial and non-commercial non-occlusive dressings were considered to be feasible to be used by first responders. So overall, this led to following practical recommendations. If you have one, use a specialized commercial chest seal to cover the hole. If you don't have one and there is severe bleeding, cover the hole with a gauze dressing, but do not let the dressing seal the wound completely 
and replace the seal if it's necessary. If there's limited or no bleeding, leave the wound uncovered. In April 2019, the content writers rewrote the manual according to the recommendations that were made by the expert panel during our expert panel meeting in March. In addition, CBAP addressed several additional PICO questions that were raised during the expert panel meeting. In May 2019, there was a third virtual expert panel meeting to approve the final version of the manual. In the summer of 2019, the manual was laid out with approval of the expert panel. So currently, we are in a pilot testing phase of our manual. So we are conducting first responder trainings in Malawi using our newly developed FAFR training manual. And the final rollout of the FAFR training in Malawi, South Africa and Zimbabwe is scheduled for early 2020. And this brings me to the end of this presentation. I would like to acknowledge our uh, colleague from the operational department, Joost Sommen, who did a lot of the practical work on this manual, the colleagues of CBAP for the evidence gathering, and of course, the expert panel for providing their valuable input, and our two content writers, Gillian Daisy and Martin Akers, and of course, you for sitting out this presentation. Goodbye. <laughs>